Right, before I start, I'll just get your attention. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yep. yep. My name's Mike Barner and I'm a documentary filmmaker. I've been making documentaries or nature documentaries predominantly for 20 years now. Um, and uh, I thought I'd take this chance to sort of tell you a little bit about what I do and why I do it. And also uh, for you kids, um, tell you about how you can possibly end up doing this as well. Um, now, I first started making television back in 1990, and I didn't start with uh, natural history documentaries. Uh, that's what I always wanted to do. Um, I actually started at TV3, and uh, the first uh, film that I made, or uh, the first story that I did for TV3, was in fact a sports story on surfing. Now, even though I wanted to get into film, uh, getting into film and television wasn't that easy. It's a very difficult uh, medium to work in. Um, it's very technical and it takes a lot of concentration, it takes a lot of work um, and a lot of commitment to, uh, to make uh, documentaries, and particularly natural history documentaries. Um, what I needed to do in order to make natural history documentaries was, first of all, I had to get a reputation for making television. So what I started doing is working in the sports department of TV3. Before that, I was a journalist for eight years, and I worked in special interest magazines like Surfing Magazine, uh, Windsurfing Magazine, Skier Magazine. And that gave me an opportunity when TV3 set up to actually get into television because they needed sports journalists. So that was my first opportunity to get in. I used that, got into TV3, and then what I needed to also do, and this is really important when you make films, is you need to have an understanding of all the areas of filmmaking. You need to be able to work out how to make a film on time, you have to be able to make it on budget, and you have to have a real understanding of what it is that you're doing in terms of what the product is that you're making. So I worked in uh, current affairs, I worked in news, I made television programs, I did uh, television commercials, and all that time, all I really wanted to be doing was, uh, was making documentaries, and particularly animal or wildlife based documentaries. Now in 1993, I was lucky enough to get an opportunity to, uh, to make my first film, uh, and that was with uh, TV3 and New Zealand On Air. Clinton, you'll remember this. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and that was uh, a film on sharks. Now the reason why I chose sharks as a, uh, as a, uh, as a topic was because nobody was really doing much with sharks at that stage. Um, the thing about any business that you try to get into, you look for windows of opportunity where you can get in the door. And no one was doing much on sharks. Everybody's fascinated by sharks because you have a, an idea about sharks before, you get, before anyone says anything about them. Everyone's afraid of them. So we've already got a villain, the shark's always a villain. So it's an easy subject to make uh, a documentary on. So I pitched an idea, and this is the first documentary that I made in 1990, and I'll show you a little bit of it. wasn't really any sharks in that though. Um, now the, 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 uh, the thing about, uh, about this film was in order for us to, to make something that was going to be a little bit unique we had to do something that was a little bit different. Now I was working with a colleague of mine called Craig Thorburn at that stage was the curator of Kelly Tultons and we decided we were going to spend a bit of time working with Marco sharks um, largely because nobody had ever worked with them before. Um, nobody had got in the water with them and certainly nobody had hand fed them before. And uh, for us in that film, we needed something that was going to be unique and, uh, and different. And I'll show you just a little bit of that. This is the first time Marco sharks were ever hand fed in open ocean without a shark cage. Again, this Marco surprises me. Look how quick the movements are. Eyes twitching and head twitching from side to side. 
She's appeared out of nowhere, chased off the blue, come in and immediately hits the old school. It is incredible to see just how confident this marker is. In classic style, she easily bites the path and outboard for a couple of shakes of the head. As previously mentioned, white pointers have been documented rolling your eyes back during an attack. This is done to protect the eye from damage during feeding on live prey items. Throughout our encounters, we have not seen this in a closely related marker. And this raises the question, if they do in fact normally roll your eyes while attacking live prey, then the marker in this situation is obviously intelligent and confident enough to quickly assess a handling situation and realises that regardless of our size, we pose no threat to it and are simply offering food. The Marcos are truly an amazing shark. Their warm blood and relatively large brain seems to make them a thinking machine unlike any other shark. Right, now after that film, um, and that film did really well for TV3, I got an opportunity to work for Natural History. And uh, Natural History is one of the biggest natural history filmmaking companies in the Southern Hemisphere, um, and, uh, and at, at the absolute cutting edge. So it was a real honour for me to get that opportunity and go and work with them. Now I made documentaries for Discovery Channel and National Geographic um, through Natural History for close on to, I think, 15 years. Now here's a few, I'm going to show a few of the beginnings of some of the films that I've made. Now when I say beginnings, I mean the beginning of the film, and this is really important because we'll talk about this later on, um, rather than intros or the start. Now with these intros what, or these uh, beginnings, I want you to look at what each one of these beginnings contain because this is really important in the art of storytelling and we'll talk about it afterwards. Alright, now I went on to make another 17 films on sharks after that. Um, when you start making or get trapped in a particular genre, and uh, that was definitely my genre for a long time, um, you get a reputation for making those sort of documentaries and you follow through very easily. Um, that was some of the, uh, there were some of the most amazing films that I've made and I was, I was very lucky to have got through them all. We did uh, a lot of uh, amazing things with sharks that people had never seen before. We filmed all over the world. Um, it was a great opportunity and that was really sort of when I sort of hit my straps as a filmmaker. And, uh, and the, the reason why I got into that was because it was a subject I loved and that's really important because getting into filmmaking 
the easiest thing for you to tell stories about is things that you really enjoy or that you love. Getting out of that genre afterwards is always really difficult. Now, at that stage, I was feeling as if I wasn't being challenged enough and I wanted to uh, step outside my comfort zone and try making films on in a different genre. So I decided that I was going to do a little bit of work uh, for the Red Cross overseas, and we did a series called Hope and Hell. Now, in Hope and Hell, we visited uh, every major war zone. We went to disaster areas. We went to um, Chernobyl um, and walked around there, came out um, well radiated, uh, if everyone knows what Chernobyl is. Um, and uh, at the end of that, I, um, I felt that, uh, that what I was also doing is I was trying to get rid of the fact that I was be becoming desensitised when I watched news. You know what uh, desensitised is, guys? Um, it's, it's when you become less sensitive to something. And if you watch the news and you're unaffected by, by what you're seeing, and a lot of us are regularly, um, we can watch a scary film and be afraid, but we can watch the news and not feel sad or feel emotional. Um, I wanted to change the way I thought about things, so we embarked on making this series. And I'll just show you the intro to this. Now, all of those, if you think about that particular film and you also think about those other uh, beginnings that I showed you before, all of them are a, a vital, or t start the, the, the vital part of storytelling, and that is they, they start the beginning and they tell you about what you're going to see. These guys that you just saw there are heroes. When we see sharks, we immediately think of villains. And this is a really important part of storytelling. And... When it comes down to, when, when you look at the fact that I started making natural history documentaries and then I, then I went across and started making films on, uh, or war correspondent types of films, how did I actually manage to do that and still be successful? Because that show was a, was a great success as well. And the reason is, is, is what I actually am, because I'm not a natural history filmmaker, I'm actually a storyteller. And story has absolutely everything to do with what you do when you make television. And, and story is, a, is, a, is an interesting thing to, to, to work out because story is completely unique in the way in which we tell it. Um, if uh, any of you uh, remember, for instance, uh, a couple of books here. Anyone read Where the Wild Things Are? Did your mum and dad read you those? Yep. Cinderella. Little Red Riding Hood. All right. All really, really classic stories. But they're more than just classic stories. They're responsible for programming us in the way that we perceive story and what they do is they have a story structure and that story structure is a map so if you're going to make a film you have to have a map and story structure is how you map out that film and make that film a success and it's a really simple structure and if in, a, in any story there are basically three parts there's a beginning there's a middle and there's an end and if you make a film in that structure and you follow that structure really carefully, there's a much higher chance that your film's going to be successful. You think of films like Pulp Fiction, for instance, which anyone know, what, uh, anyone see Pulp Fiction as a film? Everyone loved that film, it was a great film, but it didn't work at the box office and the reason why is it didn't tell story in the standard story form. Now, all of those intros you saw story starting where we, where we developed, we told you what the story is, we tell you what the characters are, you get into the middle of the story and you tell all of the information that people want to learn and then you've got to have an end. And at the end, 
you reveal either a payoff or you finish the story. In a documentary, it's often a question, which is what the story is about. Um, you know, why is the shark there? And then we spend the entire middle of the story finding out why it's there, and at the end, we can tell you the answer to, to why it is actually there. And that story structure is really important. And that comes from the fact that we, we learned that as children. Now, I'll show you another film here. This is a film called Tuna Cowboys, and I'll show you the start of this film. Uh, this film did incredibly well overseas. It was one of National Geographic's um, uh, best rating shows for a year. Um, and, and, it, and it succeeded where a lot of other shows wouldn't. It was a water-based film, and into the American market, uh, water-based films don't normally do well. I'll show you the start to this. The ocean, a harsh and unpredictable mistress, mysterious and deadly. But for some, it is a way of life, the only life they know. Year after year, these hardy souls brave the seas in a tiny boat. To bring back one of the ocean's most sought-after treasures, the bluefin tuna, the course to Australia's treacherous southern ocean. But high winds and crushing waves are not the only dangers they face. You know the sharks are always going to be there. They're always there. You just got to keep them on the job and get it done. This is the story of a new breed of cowboy and a new kind of roundup. One successful expedition can bring in a haul worth $11 million on the open market. But they'll have to cheat death a hundred times to bring home the herd. These are the tuna cowboys. All right, cheap death a hundred times. Well, as a, as a beginning to a film, that told you there's going to be action. It told you there's going to be drama. It told you there's going to be danger. There's going to be big sharks. There's going to be big, big waves. But something else was missing. For a beginning, there was something else that was absolutely critical for that film to be successful. You know what it was? We didn't know anything about our characters. We hadn't done any character, develop, and in the be uh, character development. And in the beginning of a film, you've also got to establish characters that people are either going to hate or they're going to like. So you've got a villain and you've got heroes. That's why making films on sharks is really easy, because they're already villains. So all you've got to do when you set it up is say the word shark and people want to watch it because they're afraid of them. Well, in this case, we had a great story, but what we hadn't done is because we don't relate to the characters in the film yet, we haven't finished the beginning. I'll show you the next part of the beginning. What makes a man like Nick Hooker do what he does? Maybe it's the challenge of doing a job few can do well. Maybe it's the heady rush of living on the edge. Or maybe he's just got a little of the cowboy in him. Whatever the reason, it's not hard for Nick to identify with these Rodeo men and with the real-life cowboys of the old American West. Like them, he has to wrangle wild animals and make sure he doesn't get killed in the process. He has at least two good reasons to make it home in one piece. Nick's been a fisherman his whole life, like his father before him. He's one of the world's best tuna divers. For the last 12 years, his job has been to round up schools of tuna, 250 miles, 400 kilometers out at sea, and loop them back on an arduous tuna drive, home to their tuna farms in Port Lincoln, Australia. Nick works for a man who is credited with revolutionizing marine farming and saving South Australia's dying tuna industry. A Croatian immigrant named Dinko Lukin. For 40 years, Dinko hunted tuna in the traditional way throughout the Pacific and Indian Oceans with fishing pole and net. But by the late 80s, too many fish had been pulled from the oceans. Tuna stocks plummeted. 
and when fish quality began to drop, the market crashed. But Dinko Mushin wasn't the sort to give up without a fight. Okay. Now we know about our characters. We know that the, uh, the owner of the business won't give up without a fight. So you've set up this character, this old man of the sea. And we've learnt that Nick has a family with kids at home. So there's that, suddenly there's that jeopardy of the father, is he going to get back in time? So we've connected with our characters. And this is absolutely vital in the art of storytelling. Now we understand, we, everybody relates to them. The kids, you guys will relate because he's like a dad, he's got kids. Um, the adults relate because he's the same, he's got, he's got kids there as well. The old guy is the guy who just never gives up. We've got some really solid characters. Now what we had to do was tell the middle of the film. Now the interesting thing about this film is, is when I pitched this first to National Geographic, they turned it down cold. They said, no, I'm sorry, the majority of our audience won't understand this. And we came back, and we knew this was going to be a great film, but we came back and we thought, what, what can we do to make them believe that this show... Uh, is a show that people will really like to watch. Now, all of the analogies that you've got in there about cowboys, about roundups, about farming, are in there specifically because in order for the American market to relate to it, we had to make it relatable. And the ocean, for the majority of Americans, is not relatable. So we turned the film around, we turned it into Turner Cowboys, we put in terrible words like, when they're turning the boats, like turning a hay wagon in the snow. We, <laughs> It, it was all about Rodeo, you saw Nick there at a Rodeo, suddenly the American audience related to it. And for that reason, that film was a lot more successful than it would have been if we had have left all those analogies out of there. Now I'll just show you the end, because the end is ob also very important. We've seen our character, we've met our characters, the jeopardy's in there, the middle of the film is just action-packed with sharks and, and, uh, and huge waves. But at the end, we've still got to get a payoff and everybody's got to come home safely. Around the clock battle, jumping their position and keeping their precious cargo moving steadily forward. It will be two days before Dinko sleeps again. At last they're through and are slowly edging past Cape Catastrophe on their final approach to Port Lincoln. Almost eight weeks after leaving port, the two hunters and their precious cargo are safely home again. All right, so we've got a film that worked incredibly well. That film won about 12 international awards. As I said, it was the highest rating film, National Geographic, for that year. And yet when they first saw that, they turned it down flat because they didn't think it was going to work. It's all about how you tell the story. Story is absolutely everything in film. And, and, and it, it's, it's probably best described in the way in which you present a screenplay. Now this is uh, the Wachowski Brothers Matrix. And this is the screenplay for the film. Now when you present a screenplay to a big producer in Hollywood, you have a very set format that you can present that story in. And the reason why it's in that set format is because they know there's a very good chance that if you obey those rules, beginning, middle and end, then the story has a good basis to start with. But so regimented are they that this script can be only between 118 and 135 pages long. Otherwise, they're likely not to read it. So they're going to go to the end and check it out. This one's 126 pages. Then once they've checked that the length is correct and the formatting is right and it's this horrible courier font as per typewriter. Every um, start of each paragraph has to be inset the exact correct distance. And then if you go to page 15, which I'm on here, this is the next place they'll go and visit. They'll go back three pages before that and they'll leaf through those pages around page 15 and they're looking for the change from the, from the beginning of the film to the middle of the film. And if they haven't developed your characters and set your story up by page 15 and got into the thick of it, again, they won't even read the rest of the, the screenplay. And then they'll go to the back of the film and they'll come back about five pages and they'll look for the payoff or the end. And that's how regimented the American film industry is about story. And it's for good reason. It's because when we read those books as kids, we were programmed about how we perceive story. So the first thing you do, set up the story and, and create your characters and make sure that your audience, whoever you're telling the story to, can connect with those characters. They can hate them or they can love them doesn't really matter, but they have to connect in some way. Then you can tell the rest of your story, and then at the end of that, you've got to have a payoff. There's got to be some reason why you watch that whole film, 
or in the case of a book, how many people have read a book, started reading the book, got bored and gone to the end? I do it all the time. Imagine if you could write books and you, couldn't actually, you don't actually have the end in there unless you've read the whole book. You would have read probably three times as many books as you normally read. All right. Now, finally, just in, in, in short, um, short films, there's a lot of different ways that you can tell stories. If you're going to be a, become a journalist, and I know a few of you out here probably will end up becoming journalists, there's lots of different types of uh, films you can make. You can make films like I make, documentaries. You can make feature films. You can even work for news. And if you work for news and you've only got 30 seconds to, uh, to tell that piece of news, if you tell that piece of news in a story format, it will be far more successful than if it isn't. So you can, you can put the smallest stories, if you do that, obey those, those basic rules, you set up the, the, uh, the pretense for the, for the story, meet your characters, find out what it's about, then tell your story and then have a payoff at the end, you're always going to do a lot better. Stories what what it's all about when it comes to filmmaking and, and, uh, and documentary particularly. Now, the great thing about, the, about stories and certainly news and, and journalism is everyone says, you know, if you're a journalist, what you can't do is you can't give people your opinion. Well, you can. Don't listen to them. Opinion's really, really important. But what you can't do is you can't say that that's a fact. You've got to make sure if you're going to have an opinion in there that you tell people that it is your opinion. Because people, people when, when you meet a news journalist or somebody who's standing in front of the, the auditorium like I am right now, you, you, you're looking to learn from them, you're looking to understand, and, and, and everybody has their own opinion about something. So if you're going to tell a short story like a news story, tell it with all the facts, get all the facts in there, both sides, make sure it's even, but then if you want to have an opinion, have an opinion. Now I'm just going to show a little short um, film that is playing at an exhibition that we have overseas called Planet Shark, and it's the biggest travelling exhibition on sharks. We built this exhibition um, specifically because we felt that even through the documentaries and we were making people more aware of the plight of sharks, we needed to have a more hands-on way of doing that. So we created a big exhibition that's currently it's in the States, it's travelling the world. And, and one of the messages that we wanted to get across, and, and my opinion that I wanted to get across, was about shark finning. Now obviously sharks are, you know, everyone sees them, you know, as, I, as I said before, as villains. Um, they're not. Um, they're very easy animals to work with. I've worked with them for 20 years. Um, I've got all my fingers and toes. Um, sharks are those the type of animals that are reasonably predictable in their, uh, in their behaviour, provided that you know what that behaviour is and you know how to work with them and, uh, and how to control the environment. Now, this little piece is, is a good example of telling a, a short story but also having an opinion in the story. So I'll play that. Most are killed just for their fins. 
many a thing alive and return to the sea to die painful deaths. And there is no question that sharks feel pain. If sharks could scream, we would not be doing what we do. But in silence, we choose not to imagine their torturous deaths. There are many other shark products that we consume or use. Many are on display here. Most are products that purport to have medicinal or health-related benefits. Most of them do not, and those extracts can be sourced from other, more sustainable resources. Shark fin soup is one of the most environmentally damaging foods that we choose to consume. But we can't blame the fishermen that catch the sharks. Most rely on the grossly inflated value of the shark fin to feed their families. Our focus must be on education and on reducing demand. Consuming shark fin soup is of no nutritional value to us. It's purely a legacy of a cultural tradition that suggested wealth and prosperity, nothing more. The incredibly high mercury and arsenic levels in most servings makes it dangerous to consume, and many countries recommend that children and pregnant women should not consume it at all. What does this tell us? I believe sharks have the right to live in our world. I believe that we need them in order to maintain the health of our ocean ecosystems. I don't believe that we need to eat shark fin soup. The cost of both us and the oceans is just too high. Okay. Whoops. Turn that off again. Now, story. Everything that you do is about story. It's, it's really, really simple. If you stick to that structure when you make a story, when you, whether it be in English or whether it be a, a feature film or a documentary, and if you stick to that basic principle of creating a beginning that sets up your characters, sets up the story, then you tell the story, and then you have a finish, those stories will work. Remember those stories that uh, if, you've, if you've been in the playground or, or hanging out with friends and somebody started telling a story that's really boring? And you're standing there and you're thinking, oh, how do I get out of this situation? Well, you know what? You can make any story, doesn't matter how boring it is, you can actually make it really interesting. You've just got to obey that simple rule. Now, if that person had to set up the story correctly and, uh, and created a beginning, set up some characters that you related to or, uh, or didn't relate to, and then went on to tell the story, chances are you probably would have listened through. And that's because of the way we were programmed when we were kids. That's when programs or uh, uh, books like Goldilocks and The Three Bears and uh, Where the Wild Things Are are responsible for the way in which we take a story to bits and, and, uh, and, and understand it. All right. Now, the next stage in filmmaking for me was to step outside again and try and do something that was a little bit different. Today, we have moved into 3D. I've got a 3D camera here. And for us, in the past, for me, it was about story. I could get away with telling a really good documentary. I didn't have to have particularly good pictures. It helps. It definitely helps. But I didn't have to have the best pictures. All I had to do was tell a really good story, and you could make it work. With 3D, the technology means that the pictures have to be immaculate as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show, we've just, uh, just finished cutting the first of a, of a series uh, called uh, Pacific Wonders, which is a 13-part series going over to the States. And I'll show you that film in 3D in a minute. But before we do that, I'll take some questions, because this one will go on for about 23 minutes. Sorry. Yeah. Do you have a script for your story? Yes. I, I sort of alluded to it at the start. Creating a, a map is absolutely important. So the first thing you need to do is go, what are the components of your story? And then work out a map in which you're going to tell them within that format. And then, more often than not, we're shooting a, uh, a travel log on the Coromandel at the moment. Um, it's taking us uh, four or five weeks. Almost the entire script was written before we started that. And that was a guideline for us then to go and shoot, because we know what our story structure is. We can go and get the pictures that best fit that. So script is really important. Yep? Do any of your work get set in the process of stuff? No, none of ours. No, we've had, we've had plenty of close, close calls. Um, but every risk is calculated and you're very careful about how you go about things. We think about everything we do and we make sure that we don't take um, uh, dangerous risks. It's not, it's not worth for us as, uh, as filmmakers. Discovery Channel would, uh, would absolutely fall over if they thought for one moment that there was a chance that one of our filmmakers was going to get hurt. Um, they had that happen with The Croc Hunter and, uh, and it's been a big issue ever since. But no, in, in 20 years we've had plenty of situations where, where things are, uh, are interesting but we've had no injuries and none of my crews.
Yep. Um, when smaller sharks, yes, definitely. Um, shark shark meat is is good eating, and a lot of uh, a lot of us, like I said in that first film, uh, we ate school shark for a long time. That was a, the, the the main type of fish we got at the fish and chip shop. Um, nothing wrong with small sharks. As sharks get bigger, the levels of mercury and arsenic in the body starts to build up, and uh, they become more and more toxic the larger they get. So the larger sharks, it's not worth the value. The other thing is that the shark meat has a really low value. So if you're out there fishing for tuna or you're fishing for snapper and you catch a lot of shark, then the, all that weight of shark or that body is worth very little money compared with the, 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 uh, the value of, say, snapper or one of those other fish. So they tend not to bring it back. Yep? Um, we, we're very careful about how we, how we film them. We make sure that we have a good crew around us. Um, a lot of those shots you would have seen, we've, uh, we've been involved in using electronic shark deterrence as a, a, uh, a shark shield, which is uh, created and first originally created in South Africa, that's built in, a, in South Australia, that's very, very good at deterring sharks. So if we get into a situation where, where things get a little out of hand, we can turn these little electronic fields on and it basically creates an envelope around us that pushes the sharks away. Um, most of the time it's more about making sure that we're in a situation where we're not putting ourselves in danger. Um, a lot of that stuff is from uh, Greenpeace or from, uh, from the other organisations that are out there actively chasing it. We film a little bit of it. We filmed some with the BBC um, up in, uh, in Papua New Guinea, and that was when we were filming on, uh, on the tuna fishing boats. They were finning the sharks there as well. So, you know, it's, in a lot of countries it's perfectly legal. There's, uh, there's nothing wrong with doing it. It's just uh, the, the, the impact that it's having on shark populations is huge. Well, every, everything should be kind of cliffhanger. The idea is that you're, you're building to that end, to the payoff. For instance, in the, in, the, uh, in the Tuna Cowboys film, we wanted the whole way through the middle of that film, every minute, every day, those characters were in jeopardy. And that kept you riveted to the TV set. So the payoff or, the, or the, the climax was they got home safely and everybody goes, oh, thank God for that, you know, because you've become attached to them and you like the guys and, and, and you're waiting because you think someone's going to get injured. You never quite know what's going to happen next. And that's the same thing. Cliffhanger is just a bigger version of that, so you hang everything on that end. But it's still, it's still the payoff. That's the same thing. With, with Discovery National Geographic, what we would do is we'd pitch the idea, so we'd, uh, we'd write up the, the basic synopsis for that film, and then once we'd written that uh, synopsis, they'd have a look at it and they'd say yes or no, they'd come back and say, in the case of Turner Cowboys, no, hate it. And then we'd have to either throw it away or reinvent it in some way to make it work. So before we get into the filmmaking process, there's, there's a number of different ways you can make films for, uh, for the, the big broadcasters. You can do a commission. That film was a straight commission, so National Geographic owned the whole thing. We can do a co-production where they put in some money and we, we uh, put in some money and we might keep the rights to North America or to the US or somewhere and, and that way we, we, uh, we can make some money back on the money that we've spent. Or you can make, uh, make the film yourself with the hope that you're then going to go out there and be able to sell it to enough broadcasters that you're going to make your money back. Most of the time that doesn't work. More questions? Yeah, you tend to, I, I tend to write the, the basic script um, and the, the basic structure, but then we'll get a script editor in. One of the things about filmmaking is that it, it's, it's incredibly technical and, and no one's going to be able to do all of those roles well. You have to have a good team of people around you. And there's people who are incredibly good at, at writing, there are people who are incredibly good at, at taking pictures and there's people who are great at taking sound. Making a really good film depends on the quality of the team that you put in around you. So yeah, using a, using a really good script editor, a good writer, is really important. Yes? Yeah, it's a good question. See, we make a different film for the American market than we make for the rest of the world. And that's based on attention span. Uh, <laughs> 
and it, to, to explain where that comes from is, you know, we, we grew up in a, with a mentality that we, we had three channels and we, well, kids know more channels than that, but, but you know the programs you're going to watch and, you, and you're going specifically to look for channels. In America, they've had so many channels for so long that they don't have that, so people tend to flick. So when the ads come on, they immediately change channel. So for, for, for the majority of films that you might put on Discovery Channel, at that first ad break, 50% of your audience may change out, 50% may stay with you, and you might get a completely new audience. And that new audience coming in, if you're going to hold them for the next break, then you've got to tell them the whole story at the start of that. And that, the Tuna Cowboys opening is a good example of how you're doing that. We had to tell the whole story up front, what's going to happen, what's going to be in there, to try and hold our audience for the duration. We can be a lot softer when we go into the other markets. The other, the other thing is the amount of information that we deliver to the audience is different. In New Zealand or, or, the, or the UK or Europe, we might only deliver a really cool piece of information or a great picture every two to three minutes. In the US, we deliver every 60 seconds. And that's part of just retaining that audience, really important. Yep? Well, we've done a lot of stuff with white sharks. We've done a lot of stuff with Marco sharks and blue sharks. Um, those are sharks that we find around New Zealand. And uh, we spend a lot of time around the Pacific with, uh, with a lot of the whalers as well. So it's a, it's a, it's a big variety. Um, I think I've filmed about 30 different species over the years. So quite a few. Yep. No, no. New Zealand, New Zealand for me has only been a very small part of what I've done. Um, working for National Geographic and Discovery, most of the time I've spent either in the Pacific, in Australia, Indian Oceans. Um, we, we have some great stories here and have told some great stories from New Zealand, but the majority of the stuff is overseas. Yep. Good question. <laughs> uh, some of it's available through Natural History. Um, uh, there's still a lot of the films that screen on Discovery Channel, a lot of the shark films um, still screen on Shark Week on a regular basis. So they're still repeating and still playing. Um, some of the new stuff that we're working on in 3D will be coming out in DVD as well. Um, and we'll release that uh, domestically probably towards the end of the year. So this film you're seeing here will probably be available to, uh, to pick up on, DVD, on 3D DVD probably later this year. Tuna Cowboys, yeah, I've, I've been asked by so many people. Because it was a commission for National Geographic, they never went to DVD release on it. And, uh, but it still repeats on National Geographic. So if you keep an eye on your sky calendar, you'll find it'll come up probably in the next couple of months. Yes? Deadliest Catch started two years after that. Yeah, and, and they went on to try and repeat with a, a, another series called Tuna Wranglers, which never quite worked. And the reason why it didn't work was because after we made that film, Osh came down so hard on the, uh, on the, on the, uh, the tuna industry in South Australia after seeing this film that it completely changed the rules and regulations by which they could, they could uh, go out there and do that work. <laughs> yeah, oops. <laughs> yeah. Yep, you can do that with one camera. That's all about acting. So what you want to do is, if you're, if you're creating, um, you don't have to if the action's good, but it's nice to go from, from a wider shot to a close-up and then back to a wider shot, and often you'll get the, the, the piece of action that you want, and then you have to think about it and go back and pick up that shot that gets in close, and, and, and so you might have to get whoever's doing it to repeat the action or, or whatever. A lot, of the, a lot of the cases with the animals that we're working with, um, we'd actually get that same piece of action or we'd see that same piece of action two or three times. So once I've filmed it in a wider shot, you know, like for instance a Marco shark, if he's circling and you're in open water, he'll come around again. So you'd start off with a wide shot and then you'd wait, hopefully he's going to come around again and you go in closer and get another shot and then you cut those two shots together. So a lot of the wildlife stuff you see where it cuts from, one, uh, from a wide shot to a close shot to a wide shot, that action's actually happened more than once. Well, I, I don't think I am credibly good at what I do. I think what I, what I'm do is, what, I, what I am is tenacious and I work really, really hard. And the other thing that I do really well is surround myself with really good teams. And that's absolutely key. 
But if you're going to get into filmmaking, you're going to get into, or you want to get into filmmaking, the first and most important thing that you must take on board is story. And that's what I was alluding to all the way through that. You've got to learn how to tell stories. If you can tell a good story, you can keep people entertained. And that's absolutely vital. Then once you've got to that point, you've got to look for an opportunity. For me, it was, I wanted to get into natural history docu uh, documentaries. I couldn't work out how I could do it. Um, I loved sharks and no one was doing anything with them. So that was my opportunity. We made that first film uh, on New Zealand. We pitched a documentary on Marco Sharks immediately afterwards to Natural History. We pitched it to Discovery Channel. Discovery Channel had nothing on Marco Sharks. We got it. And, and so it's, it's looking for those little windows of opportunity. But first of all, and most importantly, you've got to be a good storyteller. Yes, I think you do. I think it's really, really important. And, and it, it, it's, it's a very simple, I mean, being a good storyteller, is not, it's not rocket science. It's just learning about how those stories are told, what makes them work, understanding that and thinking about it. You know, when I, when I go and watch a film now, I tend to have to watch it twice because my first pass of the film will be dissecting the film and looking at, especially if it's a film that's working really well or it's, it, it's, uh, it's doing well either on television or at the box office. I'll have a good look at the structure of it first, and then I'll go back and watch it as a film. Yep. What do you think the future is? Do you go into movies? Uh, no. <laughs> um, I, th I think the, the great thing about this medium with 3D is that you know uh, Avatar changed the playing field uh, for 3D. 3D was a gimmick before Avatar really came out. And, and what's happened since that was that uh, there's been an opportunity with the, with the advent of 3D television. There's now 22 broadcasters around the world who are broadcasting in 3D. Now that's created a huge opportunity because there's no content other than feature films in 3D. So everything that I've made before, I can make again. I've just got to make it in 3D. So it's just opened the doors wide open again. 3D will never take over from 2D because it's actually quite hard to watch and you have to work hard. Your eyes are working because you're, you're focusing in different areas and, and your eyes are darting around the screen. When you watch 2D, you can zone out. It's something you can do at the end of the day, get rid of your school or work and, uh, and, and relax. If you watch 3D, you're not relaxing because it is a very active medium. So it's never going to take over from 2D. But, it, but for some, in some genres and some areas like natural history, and you'll see in this film, is a, this is a... a a film about uh, Southland and Queenstown, and it looks at how that area has balanced um, uh, the uh, industry and environment well, and that's really looking at the tourism industry. So it lends itself really well to, to beautiful scenes, to tourism, to activities, and, uh, and that's where you know, there's a big, big opportunity. In natural history, shooting sharks with this sort of gear is going to be a nightmare, but what a challenge. Because if you, if you get a shot wrong with 3D, you can't use it at all. So you've, you've, you've got to get the, tech, the technical side of the, of the shot absolutely perfect. Otherwise, you can't use the shot. So to, to go out and film animals that were filmed in the wild, um, you know, it's going to be a lot more challenging. You know, if, you, if you have a, a focus tweak or you change your, your, uh, your camera angle a little bit during a, during a shot, if the action's good enough, it doesn't really matter. You can just use it. With this technology, you can't. So it just raises the bar in terms of going out there and trying to do stuff. And uh, you know, we've got a, a film on, uh, on the shark callers coming up that we're shooting in 3D, which is up in Papua New Guinea. And that's going to be a real challenge because there's huge underwater sequences. And the thing about 3D is you can't let anything get within about 1.6 metres of the camera. So underwater, it's incredibly tricky because if anything swims across in front of the camera, it blows the shot, can't use it. So uh, to film in reef environment, environments where there's lots of fish and everything's happening around you, you almost need people waving stuff off out in the front in order to keep the front of the camera clear. So it'll be a challenge.